Uh, moving from fantasy to the more mundane topic of social security offences. <laughs> um, can I just have a show of hands, um, just so I know what knowledge base I'm working with? Who, who's familiar, um, in a very brief or general way, with the, the case law on, on Poniatow, Scott or Keating? Seeing my ex-colleagues from the Commonwealth DPP <laughs> and a few others are, but that's largely it. Okay. Um, the two cases um, I'll be talking about today are Poniatowska and Keating. Poniatowska was decided by the High Court uh, in 2011. Uh, Keating was decided in May of this year. Um, it, it would be um, in some ways foolish for me to start talking about Keating without first talking about Poniatowska, you'd be starting the, the story halfway through. But before I do that, I'll, I'll follow up from what Catherine uh, early talked about, about some general provisions in the code. So the code effectively came into effect um, in, in these provisions in, in May, Mar May of 2001, I think 24 May of 2001. Uh, they replaced earlier social security offences in the Social Security Act of 1991 and the Social Security Administration Act of 1999. Um, the provisions in the code are contained in part 7.3, which uh, relate to fraudulent conduct against Commonwealth agencies. So that can be not only in relation to Centrelink, but any other Commonwealth agency, the ATO, Medicare and the like. They include both indictable and summary offences. Um, of relevance to the, the cases uh, that I'm talking about today was the offence provision of section 135.2, which is obtaining a financial advantage. Now, uh, by a country mile, that is the offence provision that is most commonly prosecuted by the Commonwealth in courts of summary jurisdiction. Um, I think it's something like something like about 1,400 in the last financial year. The year before that, it was about 2,900. Um, it's across the country, um, substantially greater than any other offence provision. So, um, what we're looking at today is social security offences charged by omission. Now. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware that there are various different forms of social security payments that a person can receive. Uh, some of them, such as New Start Allowance, which is the, the new more modern name for unemployment benefit, generally require recipients to uh, submit fortnightly forms. Uh, not always, but generally, or, or at least a regular basis. Uh, they have to declare what their earnings and income were over the previous fortnightly period or the relevant period. Um, if clearly, if someone is declaring zero income and they had earned $400 in that particular fortnight, then it would be a commission-based offence against Section 135.2. What Poniatowska and Keating um, considered were omission-based offences. So that would be when someone is on a, a payment or a, a benefit such as, say, parenting payment or a disability support pension or the like, where they make the initial claim, the claim's granted, and they're not subject to regular fortnightly reviews. They might get a form every year, sometimes uh, on a greater period, sometimes more frequently, but there's not that regularity that you would see with a payment for New Start Allowance where they're generally submitting fortnightly forms. So they claim the benefit, they tell Centrelink what their personal circumstances are, what their, their assets are, what their income is, and then somewhere down the track, their financial position may change, um, using a very simple example, and they fail to advise Centrelink of that. Now, that may give rise to a, an administrative debt that Centrelink would write, raise against them. The question that the High Court considered in both Poniatowska and Keating was the extent to which those changed circumstances um, gave rise to an offence under Section 135.2 of the Criminal Code. Now, Poniatowska, the first case, uh, was a South Australian case. Uh, she was charged with 17 charges in South Australia under Section 135.2. Uh, for effectively failing to declare about $70,000 worth of income over a 21-month period, and that gave rise to a social security debt of about uh, just over $20,000. Now, she initially pleaded guilty to those charges in a magistrate's court in Adelaide and was sentenced to 21 months in prison. Uh, she appealed that sentence um, to a single judge of the Supreme Court, uh, and in January of 2010, that single judge dismissed the appeal. Now, under the procedure in South Australia, she was then able to appeal that decision to the full court of the South Australian Supreme Court. Uh, initially, the appeal was just against sentence, uh, but in some of the interlocutory proceedings, she was granted leave to add a ground to appeal against conviction. Um, and uh, the full court of the South Australian Supreme Court, by a majority of two to one, allowed the appeal against conviction uh, on the basis that the physical element uh, of the offence of Section 1352 
had not been made out. Now, I'm going to assume some of you have had some knowledge um, as to what the, the difference is between physical and fault elements. Effectively, that's the, the Commonwealth language for, for actus reus and mens rei. Um, relevant to the court's consideration in, in Poniatowska was the extent to which the offence provision in one section 35.2 intersected with um, earlier provisions uh, in the code. Now, section 4.1 of the code uh, says that in this code, conduct means an act, an omission to perform an act or a state of affairs. And it says that an engaging conduct means to do an act or omit to perform an act. Section 4.3 says an omission to perform an act can only be a physical element if the law creating the offence makes it so or the law creating the offence impliedly provides that the offence is committed by an omission to perform an act that by law there is a duty to perform. Now, in Poniatowska, the court was only uh, considering the first element of section 4.3, that is, whether the law, the law creating the offence uh, explicitly made it so. So did the offence provision in section 135.2 um, explicitly make uh, a, an omission to, to perform an act an offence. Now, the full court uh, said in Poniatowska that, quote, the use of the term engage in conduct in section 135.2 enables that physical element of the offence to be proved by way and of omission. So it can be done. Uh, this follows from the definition of the term engages in conduct in section 4.1 of the code. However, although it is possible to commit an offence against section 135.2 by way of omission, it is our view that the section does not itself create a legal obligation to act and not omit. In particular, section 135.2, subsection 1, paragraph AA does not create such an obligation. Now, um, that decision was handed down in August of, uh, August of 2010, and it's probably fair to say that the Commonwealth DPP's office um, was not very happy with that decision. Um, it obviously meant there was uh, a great degree of doubt as to what the current status was of ongoing prosecutions around the country. As I've given indication of the, the numbers, it, it meant that there was a state of flux. Um, the Commonwealth applied for special leave to appeal that decision, and that was heard in November of 2010. Um, interestingly, the uh, bench of, I think it was two, did not grant special leave on that occasion, but they simply referred it uh, to the full court's consideration. And the full appeal was, the appeal was heard before the full court in March of 2011, and the de court delivered its decision uh, on 26 October of 2011. Now, the High Court, by majority of four to one, affirmed the decision of the full court. Justice Hayden was the dissenting judge, and I'll come back to what his honour said um, in a little while. Um, but effectively, the, the High Court um, confirmed everything that the Full Court had said, um, that the 4.3a um, of the offence provision um, intersected with 135... 4.3a intersected with the offence provision in 135.2 did not of itself make the offence provision an omission. So, in other words, if an offence provision um, is um, going to... Uh, incorporate an omission-based offence, and it can certainly do so, it needs to be clear. And the court gave a few examples. That gave you the example, say, of a, a bankrupt who is required to provide, uh, is provided with a notice by the official tr a trustee and is required to provide certain information to the official trustee and fails to do so. That would be an omission offence. And there's actually uh, an offence provision in the Social Security Administration Act as well, under Section 74, where if someone is provided with a notice under that provision by the secretary to set for the department or a delegate and fails to provide that information under the notice, that would be an offence provision under Section 74. So the offence is the omission. 135.2 went further, and the Commonwealth was saying effectively, well, it's not just the omission, but it's the result of the omission. That is, that by failing to by omitting to tell Centrelink of a person's changed circumstances, uh, it has resulted in an overpayment to that person which they intended to receive. Now, some general comments about what the, the, court, the High Court said in Poniatowska. Um, paragraph 33, the, the court said, um, the code allows the omission to perform an act to be a physical element of an offence if the law creating the offence makes it so. Many Commonwealth statutes make it an offence for a person to fail to do a specified thing. The court then referred um, to the examples I've just given. 
the court noted that often those examples of omission type offences are regulatory in nature. Uh, section 135.2 carries a maximum penalty of 12 months imprisonment, uh, so it's clearly not just a regulatory provision. Uh, and at paragraph 44, the majority said that the principles of criminal responsibility stated in the code proceed from the view that the criminal law should be certain and that its reach should be able to be ascertained by those who are the subject of it. Section 4.3 is a reflection of those ideas. Now, as I've already alluded to, Pony's House got only con contemplated Section 4.3a, which, as I've said, uh, relates to the law creating the offence makes it so. The Commonwealth specifically disavowed any reliance on section 4.3b in Poniatowska. 4.3b, you may recall, says uh, an, an omission to perform an act can only be a physical element if the law creating the offence impliedly provides that the offence is committed by an omission to perform an act that by law there is a duty to perform. So Poniatowska explicitly um, did not deal with 4.3b, and that's how we then come to Keating's case. Before I turn to Keating, um, Justice Hayden, in his dissent in Poniatowska, uh, said and started his, his judgment with, uh, it is common for the decisions of courts to be reversed by the legislature after they have been delivered. It is less common for this to take place even before they have been delivered. Yet the legislature has got its retaliation in first in relation to this appeal. In those circumstances, it is desirable that this dissenting judgment be as brief as possible and brief it was. Now, what His Honour was alluding to was that um, the oral hearing in Poniatowska had occurred in March of 2011. Uh, the court reserved its decision and judgment was delivered in October of 2011. In that intervening period, uh, the parliament passed uh, amending legislation to the Social Security Administration Act and introduced Section 66, capital A, to that Act, which took effect from 4 August of 2011. Now, the explanatory memorandum to uh, the amending Act that brought in Section 66A said, uh, the Commonwealth has appealed the Poniatowska decision to the High Court, which has reserved its decision. The current position is that a number of past convictions are at risk of being overturned on appeal on the basis of the decision in Poniatowska. And I'd ask you to just hold on to those words. I'll, I'll come back to them later on. Uh, the Commonwealth DPP in past prosecutions um, did not rely on the notices given to a person by Centrelink to establish the person was under a duty to inform Centrelink, as it was understood that this was not required. It is not possible to defend past convictions appealed on the basis of the reasoning in Poniatowska by seeking to introduce such notices into evidence to establish the duty. So that's all in the explanatory memorandum for the, the basis for Section 66A. And 66A effectively says um, if a social security payment is being paid to a person and an event or change of circumstances occurs that might affect the payment of that social security payment, the person must, within 14 days, notify Centrelink of that change. So um, it's not the case, as it was previously, that the person could effectively only have to wait for a notice to be sent to them before advising Centrelink. By passing 66A, there is now a requirement that if there's any change in a person's circumstance that might affect their payment to um, receive a uh, benefit, whether it's their, um, changing their work hours, they start to work, they reconcile with their, their partner and they may be entitled to, no longer entitled to parenting payment single, but instead to parenting payment partnered, for example, they must notify Centrelink within 14 days. Now, the prospective application of that provision from 4 August 2011 is not in doubt. Um, what the amending act also did was to say this provision has retrospective application back to March of 2000. And that purpose, as I've noted already in the explanatory memorandum, was to effectively cure uh, any deficiencies in the past convictions. That's where we get to Keating. Now, Keating, Ms Keating was charged with three offences under section 135.2 of the code. Uh, again, she was on parenting payment single. Um, that matter was listed at the Heidelberg uh, Magistrates Court. Uh, she was originally charged on 7 October 2010, which was only two months after the South Australian Full Court handed down its decision in Poniatowska, saying that effectively omission-based cases had problems. Um, the conduct related back from May of 2007 to September 2009. Now, I understand the, um, there are a number of adjournments in those proceedings, um, given the um, High Court's appeal in Poniatowska, and it wasn't until December of last year that the proceedings were removed 
uh, from the Magistrates Court directly to the High Court under Section 40 of the Judiciary Act. And that was done on the application of Ms Keating's solicitors, which was Victoria Legal Aid. And that's how I have had some involvement in the matter. Um, Justices uh, Hayne Hayden and Bell um, granted um, the removal from the Magistrates Court directly to the High Court. It's a provision that's not often used, but it's certainly there to be used. And, and the Court obviously recognised that the questions uh, it was being asked to address uh, posed uh, relevance to um, multitude number of prosecutions around the country. Now, you recall that in Pony Tauska, the High Court only contemplated Section 4.3a of, of the Code, that is, if the law creating the offence um, makes it a requirement um, to perform an act, Keating considered 4.3b, so, um, which says, again, the law creating the offence impliedly provides that the offence is committed by an omission to perform an act that by law there is a duty to perform. Now, I'll just have a look at the time. I've got a little bit more to go. Um, five days after removing the case from the Magistrates Court to the High Court, Justice Hayne posed three questions, or reserved three questions, to be addressed by the parties. Um, on 18 May of this year, the High Court delivered its judgment. Now, question two was effectively um, a constitutional question that was being um, raised as to whether uh, the retrospective application of Section 68 infringed the Constitution's uh, separation of judicial and legislative powers. Uh, the High Court did not uh, answer that question. It did not need to because of it answered the, the earlier question, which effectively made question two a nullity. Uh, question one uh, asked um, whether Section 66A created a duty from 20 March 2000 for the purposes of Section 4.3b of the Criminal Code such that a failure to inform Centrelink of the occurrence of an event or a change of circumstances as required by Section 66A amount to, quote, engages in conduct for the purposes of the offence provision in Section 135.2. And the court unanimously concluded uh, that Section 66A did not create such a duty. Um, paragraph 49, the court said, Section 4.3 provides that the omission to perform an act cannot be a physical element of a Commonwealth offence unless relevantly the offence is committed by an, by an omission to perform an act that by law there is a duty to perform. The submission that section 4.3 is silent as to the time at which the obligation is imposed should be rejected. The use of the present tense in section 4.3b is important. The exception to the general principle for which it provides applies to the, future, applies to the failure to act where there is presently uh, existing legal duty to act. Criminal responsibility under section 4.3 is confined to the failure to do a thing that at the time of the failure, the law requires a person to do. The obligation is coincident with the failure to discharge. Uh, so effectively the court was saying there was no legal duty for Ms Keating um, to advise at that time and simply the, the retrospective application of 66A did not cure the deficiencies in, in, in the interaction between 4.3 and section 1.135.2. So what does that leave us? Okay, well, Section 66A um, clearly has prospective application from the 4th of August 2011. So from that date onwards, any person who is receiving a social security benefit is under an obligation to notify Centrelink within 14 days of a change of circumstance. If they fail to do so, that clearly could give rise to um, Section 4.3b being enlivened in support of an offence revision under Section 135.2. What about the retrospective legislation? Or what about the earlier prosecutions, I should say? Now, um, there are a number of officers here from the Commonwealth DPP's office, and I'm sure one of them or more, more than one will jump to their feet if I get this wrong. But as I understand the general position, um, matters that are currently, or matters that were currently on foot, where charges had been laid, were being reviewed individually. Um, the court also said, I should, should add, that if there were notices the third question was, if, if notices had been sent to a person, could that give rise to an obligation? And the court effectively said it could, but it would depend on the circumstances of each case. And the factual dispute in Keating was that Ms Keating was not admitting that she received the notices. So the matter was ultimately remitted back to the Magistrates Court at Heidelberg for determination on that issue. The courts clearly said notices could be relied upon. But if you're talking about notices dating back to 2001, uh, query whether those notices are still in existence. Now, um, as I understand it, the DPP's office was considering each existing case on its, on its individual facts and to see whether there were notices that would support uh, the offence to be made out. As of uh, any new referrals from Centrelink to the DPP's office, I understand that generally 
um, a line in the sand has effectively been drawn so that the Commonwealth won't go, be, go earlier than four August 2011 for omission-based offences. Now, remember, this is omission. You could still see a brief of evidence landing on your desk for someone charged with a commission-based social security offence back from 2005 or earlier. That, there's no issue with that. We're only talking about omission-based offences here. Um, Legal Aid on its website has said that at least uh, 18 persons, as at 24 July this year, had charges against them withdrawn. And Legal Aid on its website has estimated that there may be 15,000 convictions nationally, uh, which arguably should or may not stand in light of the High Court's decision uh, in Keating and Poniatowska. Now, I don't know where that figure has been obtained from, but I'm only reporting what's on the Legal Aid website. But you could well imagine there would be, given the figures I, I earlier mentioned, about 2,900 prosecutions in the 2011 financial year and 1,400-odd in the 2011, 2012 financial year. Not all of those are omission-based social security offences, clearly, but you could well imagine that there would be hundreds and probably thousands of prosecutions um, convictions, I should say, that following the High Court's decisions in Poniatowska uh, and Keating uh, may not stand if an appeal um, against those convictions um, was lodged. That will obviously be on a, an individual basis. Um, they're the things. I, I would urge you all to go and read the cases. Poniatowska is about 15 or 16 cases, uh, 15 or 16 pages. Keating's about eight or nine pages. They're, they're short, pithy judgments. Um, the, 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 the issues that the court contemplates in both cases, the interrelationship between the general principles in Part 2.2 of the Code, um, are relevant for other offences. Um, and if anything, it will um, develop, certainly it has for me, an understanding of the mechanics of the Code and will hopefully try to assist um, you in decoding the Code, which is obviously the, the, the title of today's topic. Thank you, Andrew. Um, now, we might have time for a few questions. Andrew, perhaps I'll, can I start with you, Andrew? Um, as things stand at the moment, then, with omission-based offences, um, so an offence committed today, for example, um, what would the prosecution need to prove by way of mental element in the person who has uh, omitted to provide the information that's required under the legislation? Thanks, Justin. Look, they'd still need to provide that the person intended to obtain the advantage. So um, you'll still have cases where um, someone um, may, be, um, may have declared their income previously um, but may have been confused about whether it was net or gross or there may be some fluctuation from, week, week, from one week to the next. And, and those cases are generally a bit more grey. And from my experience at the Commonwealth, I think the, the DPP's office takes a very pragmatic approach when those factual circumstances arise. When it's a more clear-cut clear, clear cut approach, say, where uh, someone has told Centrelink that they're, they're not working and they are working and perhaps earning significant amounts of money, several hundred dollars a week, and fail to declare, then it would clearly um, be open, I think, to the prosecution to establish the inference that the person intended to uh, obtain the financial advantage um, by their failure to advise Centrelink of their change in their circumstances. But again, it will obviously depend on the circumstances of each and every case. Right. Thanks. Uh, anyone any questions? Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll ask one for you, uh, Catherine. Catherine, in relation to um, the case of Wing, um, now I, I gather Wing was a case where there'd been a substitution of drugs of, of a, of, uh, that had been imported and that the nature of the attempt was that uh, the accused believed that they were going to be acquiring the drugs that had been imported but they'd been swapped to some inert substance. That, that's that was correct. the Crown case. Yeah, yeah, that was the Crown case. Now, um, and you've said uh, there was a contention made that there had to be knowledge of the specific drugs, and that was rejected. So how would you say at the moment um, the law is as in relation to what the prosecution do specifically have to prove in those circumstances about what the accused knew or believed at the time in relation to the drugs? Well, in, in, in Wang, Justice Osborne effectively adopted the High Court's decision in Corral. Um, so the law the law as it was, that there has to be a real or significant risk um, 
that it's a, a narcotic of some kind uh, would be sufficient, uh, according to Justice Osborne, uh, under the criminal code. The court did, in Wang, still uh, contemplate that there may be cases where the Crown will have to prove knowledge of the particular drug and pointed to Justice Kaye's ruling in, in France where Justice Kaye had held that there had to be knowledge of the particular drug proven. But that was in circumstances where there was a shipping container which had imported, had inside it, which was imported into Australia, both uh, cocaine and methamphetamine, and the accused was being prosecuted on the basis of joint criminal enterprise. And Justice Kay held that in those circumstances, uh, that the Crown did have to prove knowledge of the particular drug. And in my view, Wang, Wang distinguishes brands in that way, in that way. It doesn't um, overrule it. Anyone else got any questions? No, well, thank you all very much for coming along this morning, uh, finding the new venue. I never knew this place existed until I came here then, but you know, barely knew where the old Monash was either, and I went there. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks very much, and I uh, hope you had a good morning. So.